Hey guys, you're listening to episode 217 of The Modern Acre. This week, we talked to Trey Hill, who is the owner and manager of Harborview Farms in Rock Hall, Maryland. A fourth-generation grain farmer, he and his family sustainably produce corn, wheat, and soybeans for the Mid-Atlantic region. At Harborview Farms, he and his team are breaking new ground with innovative and creative farming techniques, combining the wisdom of traditional practices with forward-thinking, environmentally conscious solutions that are shaping the future of the agricultural industry. You're listening to the Modern Acre Podcast. Every week, you'll hear from the entrepreneurs, innovators, and leaders that are changing the food and agricultural industry on and off the farm. Your hosts are Tim and Tyler Nuss. They are brothers, fifth-generation farmers, and entrepreneurs who have scaled tech startups, developed international supply chains, and built brands. The Modern Acre is ag built different. So Ty, it's been a wild week. We announced the co-op last week. It's just been a wild ride this past week, just kind of getting the the response from the community about the project. It's just super encouraging to see the feedback and responses that we've received. A lot of cool entries coming through the pre-sale list. So really excited about where this is going. Yeah, guys, thank you so much. If you haven't yet listened to last week's episode, last week we officially announced the Modern Acre Co-op, which is our Web3 project, which is an executive community focused at the intersection of agriculture and Web3. And we get into all the details on that episode. And if you're interested in learning more, check out the modernacre.com slash co-op, that's C-O-O-P, where you can learn more about the project, all of the details. If you're interested in joining the co-op, sign up for our pre-sale. That's really your next step if you're interested in moving forward is to sign up using the pre-sale form on the website. That'll reserve your spot so that when the project launches on April 22nd, you'll have access to mint the NFT and join the community. So if you're interested, make sure you have your crypto wallet, sign up using the pre-sale form. That's the modernacre.com slash pre-sale to reserve your spot. We wanted to highlight a few of the responses we got this week that just have us so excited about this intersection of agriculture and Web3. Hearing from people, Tim, it's just so exciting to see people that are passionate about the same things and excited about what we put together. So I'm going to read a few comments from people that signed up for pre-sale and the reason they, the reason they did so. I've spent my entire career working in agri-marketing. My wife and I also live and work on my father-in-law's small bison farm in South Central Wisconsin. I want to learn, engage, and possibly invest in this space. This seems like a great way of doing that. Another one, I'm a fan of your podcast and community, and we are exploring similar ideas at our company. Super interested in the intersection of ag, Web3, investment, real estate. Love the idea of a community to explore. And lastly, it's a very interesting concept and I think will evolve to provide value or a new way for producers to interact in the marketplace. It's the beginning of the future. Super cool feedback and love love reading those responses. It's cool to see kind of the eclectic mix of responses that we've got on the pre-sale. We have company CEOs, executives, people in India, New Zealand, the United States. It's going to be a really fun group of people. Yeah, it, and and that really brings us Tim to this this interview with Trey. So Trey is one of the participating mentors on the project and we get into it a little bit on the podcast, but just the the idea of bringing a range of people's backgrounds and perspectives into a community like the co-op is is super exciting to to really push and learn each other together, learn about web3, learning about advances in in ag and we get into it on the podcast but even the the play between regenerative and ag tech which is a a really big focus of the community and so trey is one of the mentors on the on the project and there's there's several more so if you want to be in a community and learn from people like trey be sure to check it out and sign up and we hope you enjoy this awesome interview with trey hey trey welcome to the show Hey, great. Thanks. Great to be here. Excited to to dig in and learn more about you, Trey, and kind of what you're doing on the farm. But let, let's start. We we just actually announced the Modern Acre Co-op last week, and you're going to be a participating mentor. Super excited to have you be a part of the project. Maybe tell us a little bit more about kind of your interest in joining the co-op. 
No, I'm, I'm super excited. Anytime anybody asks me to do anything that I completely don't understand, I'm always quick to sign up. So this definitely fit that bill with the, with the wallet and everything. So I'm super excited. I talk to farmers and, and tech people and agriculturalists all around the world on a pretty regular basis now, just trying to form networks and learn from folks. And we're always talking about how to connect with each other and connect as a group because I'm always trying to put people together. And I think that this opportunity is just awesome because you've got a really eclectic group of folks from different industries, but a lot of the industries that I'm really passionate about are the ones that I have a lot of curiosity about. So I think the the opportunity to learn there is just going to be fantastic. So I'm really excited you guys are doing it. Hopefully it'll you know, lead to other similar groups that might have uh, different levels of specialization in different different arenas for me. Yeah, we're, we're super excited about it and really appreciate you joining us on this journey as we learn it together. Well, Trey, we want to start from the top and just learn more about your background. What led you to agriculture? Yeah, I mean, mine's pretty standard story. Um, not real exciting. My grandfather farmed, my father farmed, and then I farmed, right? So I went to college, uh, went to Purdue, uh, got my farm management degree, which is like econ and agronomy, and was pretty straight laced. And came home and was was really excited to grow the farm and be the biggest farmer in the country and all that fun stuff. Um, and then as I got older, things kind of changed. My my deliberations changed, and the culture of myself changed. And we started to get more into started to turn more towards the environment, kind of more towards the reality that hey, I'm in in the state of Maryland. I'm probably not going to grow up to a hundred thousand acres because that would be my whole state. Um, and start to figure out kind of what what it is. And then as time went on, worked with a lot of environmental groups. Um, I, I call myself an environmentalist. I'm on the board of several environmental groups. I'm not on any farm groups, but I'm on the board of environmental groups. And I think that was rather intentional. I uh, got really good at being uncomfortable and really thrive in an uncomfortable situation. And I feel like I really learn a lot more. And I just felt like at like Farm Bureau and corn growers, there were so many really, really qualified, great farmers vying for the same position that there was a lot of competition. And I was like, wow, if I go to the environmental groups, I'm the only farmer and they want a farmer in leadership. So it was a lot easier. <laughs> it was just kind of worked out that way. Um, but it's been great for me to, to change the way we farm, and the way we think about things. Um, so we practice, I guess what you call regenerative practices. We're all no-till. We're all cover cropped. Um, we grow corn, wheat, soybeans, and barley. Um, but we plant everything into green fields. We try to get pollinators in order within our cover crop species and different things to really try to build the ecology, the carbon, and, and all of those things within that that facet of corn, soybean, and wheat and barley production. Now, thanks for that overview. And I, I think your point about joining the the boards of these climate versus some of these farm organizations is super good advice, I think, of, right, like, how can you be a little unique and use use what you know to maybe go, go against the traditional approach? And so I think that's a, a really awesome lesson right there. Trey, let, let's dig into the farm. You gave us a quick overview and you, you've kind of, you're focusing on regenerative, like, you mentioned coming back to the farm and kind of learning these things. Like what, what was that like for you? What were some of the challenges that you faced coming back to the farm and then the realizations that you had about kind of making changes with respect to the environment? Um, I mean, I'd say the biggest challenge was working with my father, right? Um, as, as many of us know, and I think a lot of the environmental community tends to overlook. I think folks outside of agriculture don't realize that dynamic. Uh, my father and I have a good relationship, but exceptionally volatile. Um, so change has come very with a lot of difficulty, I'll say. And when we started into the cover crops, um, we started into working with the river keepers and whatnot. A lot of it was that my landlords were members. A lot of my landlords believed in it, uh, more so than me. Um, I use the term greenwashing. I don't think it was true greenwashing, but it was basically, I was doing it, be- I was doing it for other people, right? I was doing it for job longevity. I was doing it for the vision, for the culture, for the future of the farm and probably wasn't my personal belief system. And it wasn't until I got in that environment um, and started working with the environmentalists that I started to really realize what they were saying and how they were saying it. And that led me to different answers to different questions and to question different things that I'd never would have questioned. And I found that the, 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 que- the answer I was given so many times was, well, that's the way we do it, um, which obviously is the wrong answer, right? I, you know, whether I learned it at Purdue or from my father, um, I think many things that we do in agriculture are, are probably not right. Um, we, we do what is comfortable. And once we started really listening and looking and observing the soils, we were able to, to really change the way we farm. And I don't think the way we farm is right. Um, I think it's better. And I think that it's a journey. Um, so trying to make those observations of the soil and the ecology and how the plants are reacting to one another 
has become a big part of, of the journey of the farm, but I attribute a lot of it just kind of stepping outside the box and, and really working with the environmental community. Um, and then answering their questions similar to, I, I equate it like when your kid asks you a question, right? You know, dad, why do you do that? Well, we spray that because X, Y, Z, but you, you need to, get, and then you keep getting the why, the why, the why. And after a while, there were so many times where I'd get to the end of it. And I'd be like, wow, I really don't know. Um, so I'd say that was, was probably it. Love that perspective. Trey, I want to talk a little bit about telling your story in marketing. Just looking on your website, you talk a, a lot about a lot of things that a lot of farm websites don't have. You have responsible production, partnerships, media. Those aren't a lot of common bullets on farm websites. You mentioned growing a lot of kind of commodity crops and you're in a commodity system. How have you been able to differentiate and really tell your story? I, I mean, my goal was to differentiate my products. Um, I'd love to not grow commodity corn and soybeans. I haven't figured out how to do that yet. Um, hopefully joining web three will, will help me do that, you know, find some other examples. But I think that as farmers, we need to tell our story, but I think we've often told it incorrectly or with not the right language. And I think you need to, whenever you go into a new environment, you need to speak their language. You can't go somewhere and speak your language and expect people to understand you. So I try to compare it to, to, if I'm dealing with artists, I try to compare it to art right? How are we creating this field? How is it? What does it look like? Is it a blank canvas or is it a canvas that's constantly moving and evolving? And are we creating the art or is the art being created for us as we plant the seeds, right? All farmers view it artistically and we view the beauty of our crops, but we don't talk about it that way. And I found that if you can make it relatable, if you're talking to climate folks, you talk about carbon sequestration, right? You talk about how that works. If you're talking to environmental folks, you talk about how cover crops bring the, the nutrients up. But I think that in farming, we need to really change the way we conversate, the way that we articulate, I think is imperative. And I think that so many times we've, we've kind of gone at it from a defensive maneuver. And typically a defensive maneuver is not the healthiest way to argue, right? It's not the way that you win. You don't win a debate by simply being defensive and, and retaliating to questions. You win the debate by questioning yourself and questioning the person that's answering the questions. So by doing that, it's taught me to hopefully be able to change the dialogue as I change the way I farm, but also make it so that people understand what I'm talking about, where I'm coming from. Totally agree. And, and just love that perspective. Trey, let's talk about everyone's favorite topic, carbon credits. You have been very kind of innovative and forward thinking when it comes to, to carbon sequestration, carbon credits. And we'd love to just learn more about kind of how you have thought about that. You were one of the first farmers to, to do a private carbon credit deal. And so tell us more about that and about your perspective on, on where carbon credits are going. Um, I got involved with Nori several years ago and really enjoyed the relationship. Uh, for me, it was a lot of growth um, dealing with, with um, the software company. I used Granular and they had put me in touch with Nori. So it was kind of a nice matchup because I had the software. I had the, all the information that was readily accessible. They could code it so that it would go right into Comet. So once there was a convenience thing. Um, but from a philosophical perspective, I think that that's part of the language change that farmers need. I think that climate change and helping to rectify climate change or make a difference is one, our responsibility, but also our opportunity to change the dialogue around farming. There's a lot of negativity around commodity crop growing or all farming for that matter. And no matter where you go in the world, the country folks fight the city folks. And there's just always this animosity. It doesn't matter where you go. I mean, it's crazy. And I think that if we can start to talk about climate change and how farmers can make a difference and what we can do, I think it gives us a whole different audience. I had a full page uh, layout in the Washington Post that was a positive article about a corn and soybean farmer. I mean, who would have dreamed it, right? I mean, who, if you had told me 10 years ago I was going to be in the Post, I would have assumed it would have been a very negative article. So I, I went into the carbon credits very optimistically. I'm still optimistic, but I think that they're part of a grander um, – plan. I think that farmers moving forward, hopefully, will have many different revenue streams within the ecological system, right? So you'll have carbon credits as one bucket. You'll have cover crop money for water quality in another bucket. You might have ecological systems in another bucket. And then hopefully, the, the, what I think will be the ultimate is getting consumers to purchase things with a lower carbon credit for more money that hopefully goes back to the farmer. Because if we can get it from per acre to per, bu to per bushel or pound, then all of a sudden the farmers can actually make money and then you can really institute change. Um, so for me, the carbon credit has been a great journey. 
still dealing with Nori. Hopefully going to get a, a crypto sold um, this year is kind of my goal. And But we're still not enrolling all the acres, but I think that it's it definitely has to be part of a bigger picture and part of a, a whole systems approach to food production. Super exciting and love your approach of wanting to learn something new and just diving in with kind of the next next opportunity. I definitely agree that I think the consumer is the next piece of this, of being able to trace back the impact that we're making on the farm to consumer purchasing behavior, whether that's higher nutritional value or lower carbon emissions as as a result of that product. So that's super cool to see. Trees, we kind of wrap up this section. I want to talk a little bit about kind of your unique competitive advantage um, geographically. You're, you're obviously based in Maryland. A lot of the commodity crops are grown in the Midwest. How does your geographical lo- location impact your, your go-to-market and your strategy as a farm? Um, it's awful. Um, in Maryland, I should not be competing with folks in Iowa, right? It doesn't make any sense. Um, the only advantage we have here is we have a lot of poultry production, which is our local poultry, um, at Purdue farms and Mount air. We have some, some of the bigger ones. So we have a super high density of poultry production where I am, um, in addition to some dairy and, and swine and different things, but mostly poultry. So we're a corn and soybean deficit area. Uh, so our basis is typically very strong. And I think that's what keeps us coming back to corn and beans. If you can do it really well, be a low cost per bushel producer, um, and market well, you can still make a really good living, even though we might not grow the Iowa yields. Um, but there's, for me, there hasn't been as much incentive to change um, to cater to the to the folks in the cities uh, for that reason. I think there's probably opportunities, but I think as if we can get the food industry to decompress somewhat, I think that's where the opportunities are, and I think that'll come with time as technology you know, rolls through and we can start to track things off the farm. And there's, you know, a competitive advantage for me over a a farmer in South America. But as long as that, the economics still pay to to bring vegetables from South America or from from California, um, you know, as opposed to me growing it, because our cost of production here would be higher. That makes a lot of sense. One more thing I wanted to hit on is we're in kind of an interesting time right now with rapidly rising input costs, specifically fertilizer, all farm inputs. I know all farmers, our farm is thinking about this a lot right now. I'm sure you are as well. Talk to me a little bit about how you're approaching this year and thinking about input costs and and how maybe your regenerative focus and practices have helped you mitigate some risk there. Yeah, I mean, it's all nuts. I mean, we're all going through nutty times. I mean, the, the commodities are up, but the risk is there, right? You know, if we have a draft, everybody's like, oh, well, you're going to make more money. And I'm like, yeah, I'm going to make great money, right? If I sell beans at 15 and I sell corn at seven or eight bucks, it's going to be great. But I'm like, what if we have like a 10 year drought or a 50 year drought? Like the amount of debt we'll take on <laughs> will be astronomical. Um, I think that, well, one, we're, we're embracing technology. Um, we're using um, source on every acre. Uh, we're going to use a decent amount of pivot bio on some acres. We've, we've experimented them with, the, in, with them in the past, but I think uh, this is causing me to move a lot faster. Uh, we did some trials uh, with granular the last two years where we did nitrogen trialing in a pretty sophisticated manner. And it told us that we were way, or not way, but we were overplying nitrogen by a decent amount. We were getting more from our legumes than we were really allocating for. And I probably wouldn't give myself that nitrogen credit if nitrogen was 30 cents a pound. Um, But now we're probably going to implement that a lot faster. And I think we're going to cut our nitrogen rates back drastically um, based on the research of the projects we've done on farm but also the research we've done with the technologies that we've been able to utilize thinking that, you know, we're going to get a lot more efficiencies, but beyond that, I don't know. I mean, we're, we're still going to apply as much fertilizer as we normally would um, for an adequate crop. I'm not going to try to skimp one year and then, you know, double down the next because I think next year is probably going to be worse. Uh, So I don't, I don't, I mean, as long as things are going on in in Russia, I don't see where there's any light at the end of the tunnel at this point. Um, So we're going to, Probably keep them very similar, just cutting that nitrogen back between the technology as well as the, the, the regenerative stuff, I think is going to give me a lot of credits. We're going to let the legumes grow a little more this year and different things. Yeah, it seems like a really good strategy and cool to see some of these new and innovative companies like SoundAg and Pivot Bio being used as kind of a strategy to combat rising input costs and really like see that as part of a farm strategy is super cool to hear. Trey, I want to zoom out here a little bit, talk about the industry in general. To start, what's your ag hot take? I don't know. I I don't think I fully had conceptualized. If you want to go to like a philosophical point, I've always looked at like the chicken industry and been like, oh, those guys are 
are, you know, beholden to the, the big companies because the companies raise, you know, they're contract growers. And I was like, well, I'm not a contract grower. I'm a, I'm a corn and bean grower. I'm, I'm fiercely independent. And then our profits go up. And this year it was grossly um, obvious that, you know, I, I'm a contract grower, right? I mean, the, the price of fertilizer goes up, the price of equipment goes up, the price of chemical, all my inputs go up based on my income. So essentially my income is static, right? The percentages stay the same. And I think that reality to me was a, was a bit, um, it probably was very obvious to most, but just to me this year in particular, it kind of pointed it out when really nothing changed drastically in the world. And, well, until now, but if you look at months ago and I was like, wait a second, we're still in that world. How do I break free from that and become truly independent as a farmer or and, and as a business owner and figure out how to source these things. And I think that technology is the key. That's why I've started to really embrace tech and start to really allocate a lot more of my time to researching these companies, figuring it out, um, joining a venture capital firm, different things to try to really glean this out. And then also start to think about how I'm marketing moving forward because we've got the, the duopolies on, on both sides, right? We're bookended as farmers. And I think that getting some, some decompression or decentralization in those would be beneficial. And while one person's not going to make a difference, I think that trying to figure that out for myself and get comfortable with it is probably where, where I'm at right now. Just trying to, and I think the opportunities are there. I mean, it's the, the timing's perfect, I think, or not perfect, but the, the timing is, is better than it's been in the past. That leads us perfectly to the next question, right? Like you're, you're experimenting with technology. You're really like jumping into this, investing, all, all these things. Like what, what are you most bullish on? What emerging companies or categories are, are you most interested in right now? Well, I'm looking pretty thoroughly at, at regenerative. I think that modeling and I think that getting ahead of it and figuring out how to track my products through time and through the system are going to be very important for differentiation. Um, we're doing that with a barley crop now. Barley's the only one I really have that goes to the end consumer. It's not going through an animal. Um, wheat does, but wheat's still pretty big. Barley's pretty small. So I'm, I'm sending some barley to a maltster trying to get some beer companies. We're, we're interviewing one in two weeks. That's a big one. We've talked to a couple smaller breweries and trying to get a, a true regen beer that's grown locally. And I think that it won't be for a premium and I'm just doing it just so we can have like a, a really fun team building event, right? I mean, <laughs> guys, we're getting on a bus and the whole team's going to drink beer. You know, what could be more that we grew, you know, like I, I just think it'll be super cool and, um, help me and my team and everything. So I'm hoping if we can start with that, that's kind of low hanging fruit. Um, we got two different, um, certifications so far. One from, uh, Liz Haney, uh, did one where we did a regen certification. We've done with another. That's the hard part is getting all this stuff certified. Um, I think that coupling regen with technology is kind of the key to it all. I think that we've got too many, too much space in between, because you've got the regen folks that don't want to embrace technology and you've got the technology folks that might not be thinking on the regen carbon side. But I think that the overlap and the collaboration there is insane. Um, so I think products like Source and Pivot that we talked about, you know, if we can get that nitrogen use lower, that's carbon because, you know, obviously nitrogen is a huge carbon sink. You've got it's easy. You can do it on scale or, you know, any scale you want. So it's, that's kind of where I'm focused right now. Is just trying to, to figure that out, nutrient efficiencies, carbon sequestration, um, and then I'm always playing with cover crops. Trey, we talked a little bit about what your strategy and approach is for, for this coming year, but looking maybe five, 10 years ahead, how are you looking at the farm and how you're going to be successful long-term, whether it's go-to-market, crop mix, et cetera? How are you looking at kind of the long, long-term view for the farm? I mean, my goal is still to, to differentiate. Um, and I think there's, we've got a, a guy coming, Steve Mursky's coming out in a couple of weeks. He works with USDA. I don't know if you guys have met him. Super cool guy. He's got cameras mounted on a sprayer that are going to go over my cover crops and do a 3D print of the cover crops and tell me how much biomass and what cover crops are out there. And I was like, that's the coolest thing in the world, right? And then they're going to build an algorithm. He's partners with with Microsoft. I know he's you know worked with them, with Barney, who you had on a few weeks ago. And and those folks. So I'm like, if we can start to get to that level of sophistication where I have a camera on every sprayer that's giving me a 3D print of the cover crops on the field to give me a true basis for how much those legumes are giving back and then be able to hand that to the consumer and say, hey, this is how carefully we're calculating our nitrogen. This is how carefully we're, we're calculating how much carbon is getting sequestered in the soil. 
And I'm hoping he hasn't suggested this, but I assume eventually we're going to have some type of nutrient density reader on the harvest machinery that's going to give us the differentiated product because the hypothesis would be that if you're growing regen, you should have higher density products in terms of nutrients. I don't know what in wheat and barley, it may be a negative or a positive, but I think as we start to track those things and figure it out, um, that hopefully will lead to increased revenue for me. Yeah, I love where your head's at and how you're thinking about it. Last question, Trey, in this section is, what's one lesson you've learned over your career that everyone should learn? Um, for me, it's don't listen to the experts. You know, I've been lectured so many times on how awful a job I'm doing farming. I've had interventions um, where folks have come to the field and been like, you need to talk to Trey. He's uh, We had a, a pioneer rep from Iowa, and he was working out here, and um, he called the gentleman that I buy seed from. And he, he said, yeah, we've got to get, we've got to talk to Trey. I planted into standing covers and I'd let him live because it was cold and damp. And I mean, the field just looked a wreck, you know, this is like seven or eight years ago when we first started. And he's like, you've you got to get Trey out here. I, I don't know if we need to talk to his father or what we need to do. And we went out there and had what was essentially an intervention of like my craziness. Um, and the field did great. I've had it happen on numerous bean fields with the fertilizer dealers and just, you know, people that are really, really smart people. Um, but I think that just everyone gets in their own echo chamber and, and I think just trying to figure out how to navigate that and who to listen to and who not to, um, and when to go out on your own is, is really important. Great advice. Well, Trey, as we wrap up here, we know you're a big time reader. Do you have any book recommendations you can share with our audience? Um, I just, uh, read the lion tracker's guide to life. Uh, by Boyd Vardy, which I really enjoyed. He did a Tim Ferriss interview. I don't know if you guys follow him at all, um, but I, I really got a lot out of it because his the the hypothesis I got from the book was that the lion trackers, like you can have three lion trackers all looking at the same thing, but the guy that's looking at it differently is the one that finds the lion. And I think that that's how life is. Like it's the person that can look at look at the, everyone looks at the same thing. It's he who can look at or he or she who can look at it differently interpret it and then implement it and act on it to me is what's most important. And I think that with me, with the the way we've been uh, farming and trying to move forward in the future is always trying to look at those things and how to interpret them and make them different and better, hopefully. That's awesome. Uh, That sounds like a a book I need to pick up. Uh, That's great. It's like 130 pages and it's small. So it's, it's like a, it's like a one night read. That's amazing. Trey, as we finish up, how can listeners get in touch and connect with you and Harborview Farms? I I don't do a whole lot of social media. Um, We have a farm Instagram that uh, we basically, I have a couple young guys at work that do it. It's more equipment and machinery type stuff. It's more of like your normal Instagram. Um, LinkedIn is probably my favorite uh, mode. Um, I don't really do Twitter just because I I haven't figured out how to make it productive. So yeah, I would say LinkedIn would probably be the best and uh, just our farm website and stuff. Awesome. We'll make sure we link that in the show notes. Trey, thanks so much for being with us. We had a blast. Yeah, thanks, guys. So, Tim, our first interview with someone from the Modern Acre Co-op. What would you think? Super fun conversation with Trey. I'd love love talking to farmers and just how progressive he's been early to the sustainability space and carbon credits and really adopting technology using granular and farm management software and that leading into using products from Pivot Bio, Sound Agriculture, companies that we've talked to in the past. It's cool to see farmers actually using these new technologies as a strategy for their farm. Totally. I think it was just so inspiring talking to Trey and has an awesome perspective of like the the nuance of these things, right? Like a, a lot of people have these hard stances one way or the other, but he's learning, he's he's putting in the work and executing on the farm. And I think that's just really cool to see. Guys, thank you so much for tuning in. We want you to be a part of the co-op. If, you, if you're at all interested, wherever you are in in kind of your web three journey, if you're a little skeptical, but kind of curious, or if you're, you know, way on the other end of the spectrum, and you're building a business that's focused on blockchain technology and web three, the co op is for you. So check it out at the slash co op, sign up for the pre sale, and we will talk to you guys next week. Mm-hmm.